So, as I said, we're picking up after the events of Mary and Joseph and the actual birth. And you remember that there was um, Old Testament prophecy that talked about that. Mary and Joseph had both been visited by an angel. And everything through this point had come to pass exactly as it had been prophesied and exactly how, how the angels had told them it would. So we're now picking up in verse 8. It says, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. So these shepherds were tending a flock um, in the area of Bethlehem, which is only about six miles from Jerusalem. It's kind of in the same country, but a little bit out from the big city. And it's said that it's very possible, we don't know, but it's very possible that these shepherds or perhaps others out in that same countryside, that the sheep that they were shepherding, it was their lambs that would be bought and used as a sacrifice in the temple at Jerusalem. In the Old Testament days, having sheep or other livestock was a sign of wealth, and it was more sort of land and livestock as opposed to today, which is more buildings and bank accounts. Job was said to have about 14,000 sheep, and that was pretty, on, pretty early on. We don't even know if there was more than 14,000 people back then, but that was a lot of sheep for that day. Solomon sacrificed 120,000 sheep at the dedication of the temple. Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all shepherds. Now, some of them were also farmers, but they were shepherds. Now, the shepherding was often a job that was handed down through the family from one son to the next. So, kind of like if Jake was here, I'd like, he still has to take out the trash. Because each of the boys had to do that as their chore. And as the one got older and left, it would go to the next one. Well, Jake's the last one, so he's still taking out the trash. And just like that, the youngest son would often be a shepherd for their life. David, who was the youngest son of Jesse, was like that. Jesse was a shepherd and a farmer. And at the time that, that uh, David defeated Goliath, he was a shepherd. That job had been passed down to him. Now, he was considered a type of Christ, like an archetype of Christ um, in Scripture. And he began his journey to become the king as a little shepherd boy. And he used his experience and the tools of shepherding um, in his famous Psalm 23. When he says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff they comfort me. And so the rod and the staff, of course, are both references to two of the tools that are used in shepherding. The rod <clears throat> was sort of a club. It was usually a long stick. Sometimes it had nails or something in the end of it. And it was used to protect the sheep um, from predators as well as from thieves. David is said to have fought off a lion with that rod. So... Um, it was a pretty, uh, pretty good weapon. The rod was also used, though, to count sheep. And it was used to separate out every tenth sheep or lamb to be given to the Lord as a tithe. In Leviticus 27.32, it says, And concerning the tithe of the Lord, or the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, a tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. So the rod in Psalm 23 was not only symbolic of God's promises to him to protect him, but it was also a reminder of those people, the ones who are separated out from the flock, to become holy unto the Lord, which of course is his people. <clears throat> the staff now was um, just usually a tall stick, some people say it would have a crook in the top, but how many sticks do you know that have a crook in the top? So that's probably just the movies. But this, the staff was actually a long stick. And it was used for two purposes. First of all, it was used to sort of steady the shepherd as they walked. They were often walking through rocky places, hills, mountains, valleys, things like that. And they would use it to steady themselves as they walked. It was also used, though, to help in directing the sheep. They would just sort of tap and kind of guide the sheep through narrow passages to keep them on the path. It was also used as a symbol of authority. 
So not in shepherding per se, although the one with the staff was usually the shepherd, so in that sense had some authority. But as time went on, kings and other rulers would use a staff to show their authority. And that actually comes from the staff of the shepherd. You have the classic picture of Moses holding up his staff when God parted the Red Sea. Now, that might have just been Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments, but it makes the point. Either way, it's reminiscent of the shepherd's staff. So David was comforted in his Psalm 23, knowing of God's power to protect him and save him by the rod, and his sovereignty and authority over him and all of creation, the staff. Another tool that shepherds would often, or yeah, tool, equipment, whatever, that they would have is called a scrip. Um, you can maybe, maybe think of it as like a man purse nowadays, but it was just uh, made out of skins, and it was just a pouch, and they would carry various things in it. If they were going to be gone for a long time, they might carry some food, some bread, some oil, and so on uh, in there to eat. They might have other little personal items and supplies with them in that scrip. Um, it's thought that David would have used the scrip to carry those five stones that he took with him into battle against Goliath. Which brings me to the next one, a sling. Now, some people might think of a sling as a today's slingshot, but they didn't have rubber bands back then, as far as I know. The sling was actually just a small pouch made of skin and had two long straps on it. And they would put the stone in there, and they'd swing it over their head and let go of one of the straps, and the, the rock would be used to, as a weapon, um, as it was with Goliath. But it was, not also, it was not only used as a weapon. It was also used in shepherding the flock. When there were sheep far ahead of the shepherd that were starting to go off the wrong way, the shepherd would throw a rock and hit right by the feet of the sheep that was farthest away, and it would help them to move back into the flock. So it can be used as a weapon, but that weapon can be used to correct us, to put us back on the path. So there's a rich history in the Bible around shepherding. However, at the time of Jesus' birth, um, because the economy had changed, shepherding was not the big show of power as it was. People now had money, coins, and so on. Um, but at the time of Jesus' birth, it was common for shepherds to bring on hired hands. Now, when I was researching the sermon, I was getting a lot of conflicting information about shepherds who were, you know, in, in the likeness of, of someone like David right, or Moses or whatever. But then they were saying that a lot of them were thieves and robbers and, and unreliable and so on. So I'm trying to find out, like, where's the right answer, okay? Um, well, it turns out both are probably true. A true shepherd is the one who knows their sheep, the one who is good. But these hired hands, you might also call them shepherds, but those hired hands were the ones that were often thieves and unreliable you know, laborers out in the field. So it seems that both are true. The Bible actually speaks of how when a predator comes, the hired hand will run away and allow the sheep to be taken by the predator. But the good shepherd will give his life to save him. So which of these two groups do you expect the shepherds in our story today are part of? Obviously the good shepherds. So what were they doing that night? They're out in the fields keeping their sheep. When possible, sheep were kept in what's called a fold at night. And a fold is kind of like a corral. It can be anything from just a big um, wall of stone that they keep uh, the sheep inside of. And it sometimes can be an actual shelter, often caves. There's a lot of caves in that area. Often if it's a big enough cave and they can fit the flock in there, they'll bring them inside the cave either at night or when there's really serious you know, bad weather going on. Um, <clears throat> So the, the fold provided, first of all, protection from predators and thieves, as well as from weather. But when the flock was too far away and they had no fold, shepherds would abide in the field with their flocks at night. And they would take watches. Some would sleep and others would watch. And then they would uh, switch off throughout the night. So it's likely that at the time the angel appeared, some of those shepherds may have actually been sleeping. We don't know, but it's very likely that's the case. So what actually happened in that field that night? 
Verse 9 says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Now many sources that I read say that the original language um, of this piece of scripture indicates that it was not some angel floating up in the sky, you know, talking down to them. But this angel appeared in their midst, standing there in the midst of them, right next to them. Um, you know, I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be standing there and have an angel appear in front of me. Um, but it's no wonder that they were afraid. And consider also that it wasn't just an angel. It says, but the glory of God shone around them. I also can't imagine what that's like. Now, there are some people back in Old Testament days that remember the glory of God hovering over the temple at night and during the day. Um, but this was many years later, and this was not something people were used to. And I don't know how I would have reacted. But I'm going to read you what three different versions of modern English translations say. So the ESV version says they were filled with great fear. The New King James says greatly afraid. And the New International Version simply says terrified. In fact, I think I heard it from someone. I think it was my son Michael at Daily told me that he believes that this is the night that laundry detergent was invented. I can't substantiate that, but that's what he told me. Right, Mike? I told you I'd fit it in. Um, so then, in the middle of their fear, in their being terrified by what they're seeing, the angel spoke. And the first words of the angel, fear not. When God appears to people, we have this natural tendency. Right? And by appear, I don't mean a vision. I'm talking about when in prayer or meditation you feel the encounter you know, of God. The spirit, you know, inside of you, right, swelling up. It seems to do two things to people. Um, I've heard multiple stories of people who have had these great experiences where they felt both drawn to God and terrified at the same time. And we should be. But the angel's message is there's nothing to fear. Why? Because of what's, about, what's already happened with Jesus' birth and what's about to happen in his life. He says, For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Isaiah 41 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with, the righteous, with my righteous right hand. So, you know, it says don't fear, but we tend to fear. And then the message, what do the angels actually say? So this was the birth of Christ. An angel comes to these shepherds, and he says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior is Christ the Lord. Right? That was pretty much it. Now there's more to come, but I mean, that was the basic message that he came to tell them. It's so simple. Right? And I kind of wondered to myself, like, how could they know what that really meant? If you had no context whatsoever and an angel appeared and said those words, would you really understand? Now, they write their Old Testament. They didn't talk about Jesus so much yet. They talked about a Messiah and so on. So it was such a simple message. And it reminds me of how sometimes we try to make the gospel far too complicated. The message is really pretty simple. Um, you know, I think it's good for us to have discussions and even debate, friendly debate, about doctrine and theology. I think it's a healthy thing for the church to keep the teaching pure by exploring questions of doctrine and so on. But the message itself is so simple and so straightforward that that's all the angel had to say. So if I were to you know, to try to explain the gospel to someone, not being an angel, <laughs> I would probably use far too many words. And anyone that knows me would not be surprised with, about that. So let me give you an example of how I might explain the gospel message. We have enough time? <laughs> God is real. 
He is the one and only true and living God from everlasting to everlasting, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He created all things, and without him there is nothing. We've all rebelled and sinned against God and were separated from him without hope and unable to do anything to save ourselves from our just punishment. Jesus, the Son of God, from the beginning, the promised Messiah, was born of a Virgin Mary. Taking on flesh, he lived the life that we should have lived, and he died the death on the cross that we deserved to die. He was resurrected, ascended to heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father. And because of his grace, we are saved through faith, a faith which he himself authored in us, and once washed clean in his blood, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, sanctifying us for good works and giving us the assurance that of a salvation that can never be taken from us because it's based on the righteousness of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And now we push forward in his strength to help build his kingdom here on earth until that day that we come into his heavenly kingdom to dwell with and enjoy him forever. Not too bad. But if that's the message the angel gave, the shepherds probably would have fallen asleep by that. That's a long message. So how did they get that whole thing from unto you is born this day a Savior? Well, maybe it's because the Old Testament is filled with prophecy about the life and the work of Christ. It's filled with um, hints about the gospel itself, right? All the way back in the time of Abraham. Right? He believed and was counted as righteousness. We learn the principles of the gospel from the Old Testament. The New Testament, although simpler, perhaps, in ter- terms of understanding that message, is actually the fulfillment of the gospel that was taught in the Old. So these shepherds, if they were good Jews, and we think they probably were based on how they reacted, they knew what the message meant because they've been waiting for this day. For millennia. And uh, let me just give you a couple examples. Micah 5.2. But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be a ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Isaiah 7.14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So when in verse 12 the angel said, and this will be a sign for you, you'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling claws, lying in a manger. The angel was proclaiming a fulfillment of prophecy that any good Jew should have known. None of this should have been surprising or, or news to these shepherds. But within there, he was also providing a way, there was one thing that they wouldn't know, Exactly where do I find this child? Bethlehem wasn't very big, but it's, it's a town. It might be something like the size of Harriman or Riverton. How many doors you'd have to knock on to find that babe? So the one thing that was sort of new, right, was, well, not new, but the one thing that was specific enough not to just know of his birth, but to find him, was that he'd be lying in a manger. So there might have been a lot of babies born that night, even just in Bethlehem. And there might have been a lot of them that were wrapped in swaddling claws. It was not unusual for mothers to wrap their babies, their newborn babies, tightly with these claws to make them feel secure. Um, But the one thing that would be unique is that this child would be lying in a manger. In verse 13, it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is well pleased. Now, I know that we should avoid speculation about what Scripture means or what it, what it says when it doesn't explicitly say it. So I'm going to make, make clear that this is just a thought of mine. I don't know even if it's original. I might have heard this thought before. But it's, it's just my thoughts and not Scripture. But I wanted to share it anyway. Um, it says, you know, well... I'm saying, but that I wonder sometimes about those, um, those, those angels, those heavenly beings, what they call the heavenly host, breaking through from, from heaven into this world and praising God. 
It doesn't say that God sent them. It doesn't give any description of why they're there and what they were supposed to do. They just appeared. Well, I wonder if it wasn't so much that God sent them, but that they just could not anymore control themselves. They couldn't restrain themselves. They had to come into the world and proclaim the birth of the Savior that had been foretold from before the beginning of time, before there was an earth, before there was a universe. There was the Son with the Father. This was the plan from the beginning. And so I think they just had to come in and share their praise for God for what was about to happen. <clears throat> now, shepherds are referenced, as you're, as you're hearing, a lot in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. I did a quick search from the ESV version online, and there was 107 references specifically to shepherds. More than I thought. And interesting enough, both Jesus and man are both uh, shown to be shepherd and sheep. I thought that was interesting. Uh, John 10, 11. This is Jesus. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So he's the shepherd. John 1, 29. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's also a lamb. 1 Peter 5, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Man is a shepherd. And how many references are there to us being the sheep? So I won't even go there. But perhaps, perhaps one of the reasons that shepherds are so often used as analogous to God and man is because of the intimate relationship that you find between a good shepherd and his sheep. Um, shepherds are known to, um, let's see, they're known to lead their sheep both from in front and behind them so that they can protect them. Good shepherds usually know the name of all of their sheep if it's not an, a very large uh, flock. If it's a really large flock, they'll still know the names of all their ewes. Um, they know some of their personal quirks, and they'll use these as their name. <clears throat> Shepherds, uh, let's see. Well, and there's other examples. But um, Isaiah 52 also says, For you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go in flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Um, so the sheep and the shepherd have a very close relationship. And the shepherd is always on the lookout for straying sheep. And they will easily, quickly leave the flock to rescue one. As, um, as we say often during communion, Isaiah's words, all we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of us, God has had to go after and bring back to the flock. And lastly, when a sheep is wounded, the uh, shepherd usually carries a little bit of olive oil in a ram's horn, and they anoint that lamb with the oil to help to heal their wounds. Psalm 23 again, by David the shepherd boy, thou anointest my head with oil. He heals him. Is it any wonder that not only would Jesus be called the good shepherd, but that God would make the shepherds one of the first witnesses of his birth? So after they received this message, what did the shepherds do? 15 and 16 says, When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. So the first thing the shepherds did after the angels returned to heaven is to talk to each other about what they had heard. And then they said that they would go to Bethlehem and see this thing that had happened. You notice they didn't question it. They said, let's go see. We believe that it happened. 
And they didn't go out of curiosity or just to check it out. It says they went with haste. This is evidence that at least some, if not all of these shepherds, were believers. They knew enough to understand the angel's message. And they understood the significance of what was happening. So they went with haste to find the child. Now, as New Testament Christians, um, we perhaps have a little different perspective on the Christmas story than the shepherds did in those days. You see, we look back at what took place with joy, with thankfulness, that God so loved the world that he sent his only son into it. We're in awe and perplexed by the humble beginnings of his life, born in a stable to a plain Jewish maid, betrothed to a carpenter, with only a manger for a bed. We know the story of his perfect and exemplary life, as well as his gruesome, painful, and humiliating death on the cross, where his blood was shed as a ransom for us. And we now live in freedom from the law that he satisfied. And we know of the empty tomb, his glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven to sit on the right hand of the Father. See, the shepherds didn't know that. They didn't have a New Testament yet. They had some prophecy. They had a few ideas about what's going to happen. But they didn't have the story like we do. The song that we sang this morning might give you a better idea of how the shepherds looked at Christmas. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. O come, thou rod of Jesse, free thine own from Satan's tyranny, from depths of hell thy people save. And give them victory over the grave. O come, thou dayspring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. You see, their faith was truly a hope for things not yet seen. Not until that moment, anyway. Verse 17 through 20. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Verse 19 does not say, and Mary treasured up all these things. It says, but, as if to say that the people may not have fully understood what they just heard. Mary did. Bethlehem was a small town. Mary and Joseph were strangers there. There's no record I could find of Jesus ever visiting Bethlehem during his ministry. All who heard were perhaps not that many people. And it seems that not many people knew who Jesus was when he began his ministry. There were some, but it doesn't seem like a lot. So could such an event as the birth of Christ, shared with a few townspeople, people by a few door-to-door evangelists, have had so little impact? Absolutely not. Because here we are, 2,000 years later, talking about that very message that the angel gave to the shepherds, which they in turn told the people of Bethlehem. And it has been told again and again down through the ages. But why should we believe it? After all, it was told by a bunch of shepherds. Why was this news not proclaimed to kings and princes? Why was it not shouted from the mountaintops? To the masses? Well, I don't know. Any more than I understand how a grapevine produces a grape. Out of dirt and dung. But I do know a good grape when I taste it. 
And the people of God know his word when they hear it. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And their word is not the only evidence. Remember, there were prophecies foretold about the events of Christ's birth, his life, his death. You know, in a court of law, that's called corroborating evidence, and it's pretty strong evidence. So it doesn't matter if Jesus was born in a manger or a palace. It doesn't matter if the angel told a few humble shepherds or the whole world. It doesn't matter if you were there to witness that glorious event firsthand or just from a friend or evangelist a few years ago. The truth is the truth. And if you're a believer, I hope that you never stop wondering at what those shepherds saw and heard, that you never forget the witness of a few lowly shepherds and the truth you heard when first you were saved. And I hope that you'll now share that witness with the world. And whether you have heard and believed or not, I pray for you as Paul did in Ephesians when he said, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. For far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Jesus, whose birth we celebrate now, is that hope. His birth led to that glorious moment on the cross when he ransomed captive Israel. When he ransomed you, if you've put your faith in him alone for your salvation. Not in yourself, not in institutions or buildings or idols made by the hands of men, and not in traditions and religious practices, in Christ alone. And if, if you have not yet done so, do it now. He stands ready to receive you. John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, Who, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. So what are you waiting for? We don't need an angel to appear for shepherds to come. We have something better. Through Jesus, we now have direct access to God through prayer and through his word. So this Christmas, take some time to reach out to him, commune with him, and remember that beautiful message given to the shepherds. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And join with the hosts of heaven to proclaim glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Amen.